Hello and welcome to the BBC Good Food podcast with Tom Kerridge. I'm Orlando and we're here today to talk about exciting ingredients, cooking techniques and general kitchen chat. Plus, we have an original Tom Kerridge recipe for you to try out at home, whether you're a beginner or a budding chef. Hi, and welcome to this week's BBC Good Food podcast with Tom Kerridge. Today we're talking about old-fashioned puddings, comfort food at its very best. We have a great Tom Kerridge recipe coming up for you, but before that, Tom, what puddings do you remember from your childhood? Always steamed, steamed treacle puddings, like like a golden syrup puddings, delicious. Those sort of, those sponges that my mum could sit... Boiling in. Do you remember those old pudding basins? You don't see them so much anymore, like the the China ones with yeah. the cloth on the top. Sat Sunday lunchtime, sat there bubbling away from about ten o'clock in the morning till till then it, when it was actual lunchtime. That's what I remember from being that and Viennetta. <laughs> <laughs> There's something wonderful about a steam pudding bubbling on the hob. Uh, I'm a great fan of suet. Are you, do you like suet? I absolutely love it. I think it's fantastic. It gives rich. It gives depth it gives flavor it and it gives this kind of a, a real kind of solidity to, to 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 so many things like pastry of course but also when you steam it it's delicious vegetarian so any problems with that because um, we use it in the test kitchen and it, it seems to work perfectly well but does it give the depth of flavor that you're looking for to be honest i've not used it so if i'm going to use suet i do it because it ha- it's about having beef suet in fact we actually make our own at the restaurant so we take we take beef fat and mince it ourselves and use that so so it's even got more depth of flavor it's that very hard sort of crackly kind of fat isn't it that you, exactly and then you yeah. put it through the mincer do you that's exactly that yeah. exactly that but then if it was uh, i mean if you were going to use um if you were going to use if i was looking for doing a vegetarian friendly dish i wouldn't i would just do the sponge without doing vegetarians yeah because the sponge per- well exactly. works perfectly yeah. well you yeah, don't yeah, have yeah. to have this and any horrible puddings at school most of us have some kind of horror story that we remember yeah, I mean, I, I mean, we all talk about blancmange, don't we, as being one of those like bright pink school desserts that I always remember and going, oh, that was pretty dodge. However, like when you look back and junket as well, junkets were pretty bad. Although I have worked somewhere where we used to have junket on the menu and it was delicious. So I think it was probably more the execution yeah. <laughs> rather than the actual dish itself. Do you know, we have a lot of feedback from our Twitter followers and they have a real problem with pink school puddings. Yeah. <laughs> they talk about um, pink custard, um, something pink, which were iced, they could, were passed off as iced buns, but were in fact hot dog puns, buns with a bit of pink icing and, and sprinkles put on top. Yeah, I remember them. They also talked about something called chocolate concrete, <laughs> which is obviously... <laughs> blancmange gone a bit ah solidified yeah and then i worked with someone once who had fond memories of um roly-poly i I think it was roly-poly which they all called matron's leg (laughs) (laughs) i love that see uh, when i used to play rugby at a rugby club we always knew a kebab like a donna kebab that was known as elephant leg (laughs) Very similar sort of thing. (laughs) But they can, of course, be wonderful. I think with old-fashioned puddings, we're really talking about crumbles, steamed puddings, baked puddings, um, and a cobbler. We've got a recipe for a cobbler, which is going to delight our listeners yeah. coming up. Yeah. But just remind me of what a cobbler is. I've well, heard of one, but I don't think I've ever made one. It's kind of very similar to a crumble in terms of you have that beautiful stewed fruit base and, you know, you can use any f- fruit that you like. It, the beautiful thing about crumbles and cobblers is they are very British and they're seasonal and you use the British fruit. So in the summertime, you can use red berries and then as it goes through, through into autumn and winter, you're using apples and pears or, you know, this is a bit of a crossover. So where plum season is big ending and the apples are starting, in. that's so you, it's that stewed fruit base and then the topping is similar to a to a crumble except it's more like it's kind of mixed with a little bit of milk and it's it, you make pretty much um i i suppose uh, they're like dumplings. I kind of there's kind of like baked sweet dumplings that are just spread on the top. I'm, so it's a bit more robust than a crumble. I'm looking forward to it enormously later, yeah. and it's winking at me from yeah. its, its uh, <laughs> dish over there, giving you a little wave. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that they're a British thing. I think they are they a particularly British thing, or do you encounter them in different parts of the world? You you travel a lot, so you see yeah, what, I what's think... happening. 
I, I think desserts change like the way, like the French. I mean, the, these desserts they don't they don't transcend into Europe. They're not the sort of things that happen. They're, you you have a lot more. The French are much more refined about what they do. They have a lot of really you know lovely tarts. They they put a lot of effort into doing something special. Whereas here, I think in in what we do here in Britain is we we take big robust tastes and flavors and we make them stunning the things that sit alongside stews you know we are very good we're a, you know we again we're a northern european country that's cold and you go well most of the time we like beef stews and we like smoking and pickling and curing and all of those sort of things that keep us going well the puddings kind of fit into that bracket as well so they're all about none of them are necessarily the prettiest desserts but they are all delicious in what they taste like they they've got a reputation for being quite heavy heavy. Is there any way that we can shoehorn them into a healthy diet? Um, see, there was a long pause there as I'm trying to think of a way <laughs> on to, Sunday, go, perhaps? to go. On Sunday, Just yes, on Sunday? Exactly. On Sunday. <laughs> in, on Sunday, when you've been to church and you've prayed for a healthy pudding. Uh, but so, uh, listen, they're, they're about they are, listen, they're going to be high in sugars. They're going to be high in carbohydrate, but they're also high in flavor. And there are ways that you can change them about. You can do, you can cook with lower calorie um, sugar alternatives. You can use, uh, you can use Greek yogurt. You can use lower fat creme fraiche. You can use all of those sort of things. But actually the best way that these desserts are eaten are as a treat, as something special, as you know, puddings as puddings should be. But listen, you don't have them every weekend. You don't have them every Sunday. Every now and then, you enjoy yourself. Have a great pudding. And don't have seconds, perhaps. Don't make make it for eight when there are only four of you so that you eat it all up uh, the following day. What perhaps. a good idea. What a good idea. I'm, I've also thought of a good thing. A lot of them have got fruit in them. So there, there's one of your five a day, isn't it? Well, yeah. And do you know what? Actually, healthy isn't always about the food that you put in. I know it is a lot of. However, health is a mindset and something like this makes you happy. Spending time with people, spending time with friends and family, having people over lunch, cooking if you enjoy it, putting thing, all these sort of things together and then eating something that you love makes you happy. That is healthy. Just not doing food like this three times a day for every day then that's unhealthy. But actually the mindset, the happiness, the warmth that it gives you, that is definitely healthy. Do they go down well in your restaurants? Do you do old fashioned puddings or, or, or takes on them? Yeah, we do. We do lots of kind of, uh, uh, particularly um, when it comes to the set lunchy kind of thing. So we used to have a junket on every now and that comes in. It falls are lovely. You know, those lighter things and lunch times where you've taken that lovely stewed fruit puree and mix that with, with, with whipped double cream. You know, those sort of things. Great British British desserts like that are lovely. And, um, and bread and butter pudding, pudding sometimes? Bread That's, and butter pudding pe is people, great. Most people love that. I think some people hate it, but most people love it, I think. And one of the best selling dishes that we have ever always on at the coach is um, steamed sticky toffee pudding that oh, we do yes. with, with, with beef suet through it. So it's beef suet, sticky toffee pudding, and it's a massive seller and people absolutely love it. That's meant to have been invented in Cumbria, I think. It's a late, right. a late district thing, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, near Cartmel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. It's, yeah, it's yeah, it's a fan, and and they do it beautifully. Do you miniaturize the desserts so that they then they're not too big? Yeah, we do for the restaurant, so individuals can have it. Because if you wanted a souffle, but I wanted sticky toffee pudding, you get an individual portion of it rather than cooking one big one. Definitely. Yeah, I I sometimes feel at the end of a meal that I'd love to have a, a dessert, but if it's too big, it's just going to um, wreck my afternoon. Yeah, you don't so want to like be a over little, a little one, really. I think. It, well, that's what you do, probably. Yeah, we try to make sure that it's part of a three-course meal, not being overfaced by this massive pudding. And, and I get why people want big puddings and that, but we just try to make sure that it's the correct portion size rather than it being too huge. That's a real art. Is it the pastry chef who always makes all the desserts in a restaurant? I'm rather out of date about how restaurants organise themselves. Yeah, but or is, is it a mixture of people? Well, there's a, there is a person on pastry, there is a pastry section, and it may swap out. Some places don't have pastry chefs as such because they're quite a specialist role. But most chefs know how to make good puddings. Most chefs should be able to make sticky toffee pudding or, or steamed suet pudding or a crumble or a, you know, a creme brulee or something like that. Most, most good chefs will be able to do that so then uh, but uh, the reality is there's a pastry section and if you're lucky enough you've got one of those trained pastry chefs that know what they're doing 
they're scientific kind of guys, aren't they, the pastry chefs? Aren't they slightly different from the rest of the brigade? They are most definitely different from the rest of the brigade. So the rest of the brigade, so I am definitely a hot kitchen cook, okay? So you work on touch and feel and instinct and uh, uh, how each muscle breakup is different and how much water content is in vegetables as you're cooking it. And you have to move and flow with it, whereas pastry chefs are much more about precision and understanding and exacting recipes. And so they are slightly, they are different. They also always have blunt knives. <laughs> <laughs> Do they work different hours as well? No, no, they they're they, in at the same time and they, they leave at the same time. In our don't restaurant, they finish later because the dessert comes at the end of the meal? The dessert comes at the end of the meal. Meal, but the rest of the brigade are cleaning the kitchen down whilst they're still sending dessert. So it, as a, you arrive as a team and you leave as a team. Right. I, I also want to hear about the guy who makes the bread, but we'll save that for another podcast because I think that's going to be a really exciting um, thing to hear about. They're even more removed from society than the, <laughs> than the pastry chefs. They have even blunter knives. <laughs> <laughs> and they're usually hovering around in those kind of incubating cupboard type places, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, watching bread prove. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a very steamy it's atmosphere. It's a mad skill. Being yeah. a baker is amazing. It's a brilliant, brilliant skill. That's one to look forward to, I think. The other thing that has come in from our Twitter friends is they're obsessed with custard. People are obsessed with custard. This seems to be the necessary accompaniment to a, a pudding. Um, where do you stand on custard, Keen? What, what do you mean? Where do I stand? Do I like custard? <laughs> Who doesn't like custard? I do hot, cold. Oh, I forgot to say, they don't like pink custard. <laughs> oh, yeah, very true. No, I'm not up for pink custard. But yeah, hot, cold, beautiful, freshly cooked and made with eggs or or even the powdered, like, you know, the powdered custard you used to have as a kid. I love that. The oh, stuff bird's that, custard. Yeah, that was set in in a trifle. Absolutely yeah. love it. It's got it. corn flour in it, hasn't yeah, it? Exactly. To help the set. Yeah, exactly that. Uh, the, uh, homemade custard has problems for the home cook to make unless they've got something that we both i know we both like which is this thermometer yeah this is your digital thermometer because you need to take it to a certain temperature don't you yes about 82 degrees and then once it's at 82 do you hold it at 82 or is 82 mean job done and we can all go hold home? It at 82 and keep whisking it take the pan off the heat and keep whisking it for a while and then pass it through a sieve and leave it to cool you guys are always passing through things through sieves, so aren't get you? Bits out. Well, obviously you're using fresh vanilla in your custard, so you've got to get you've got to get the vanilla pod out. <laughs> do you save the vanilla pod and reuse it? Not once it's been in custard, no. But if we do scrape it before and not you and just use the seeds, then that gets used in. Um, so we always scrape it out, but the the pod itself might get infused into sugar or to something else. Whereas if it's all it gets scraped and the pod and everything goes into the milk and cream that's coming up to the boil to make the custard pass it out and that's it gone but the seeds are then still through they pass through the because seed. they're absolutely tiny but um it's such a waste of a vanilla pod when you think it's kind of seed of an orchid or something marvelous like that it seems that's a shame that people so people eh? throw them away i know some people grind them up with sugar have you yeah. ever done that to make strong vanilla sugar yeah yeah infused sugar it goes really well is that a sort of um gray color or brown color or, do, or well you not... can just leave it in there and then remove the pod from it okay. so it's kind of just infused its flavor in to the sugar granules or, uh, or you could blend it all up together and then you put it on a tray then it goes it's quite wet but then what you do is you leave it on a tray above in a warm place and let it re-dry out again and yeah you got this beautiful vanilla sugar wonderful well a, a good reason to make some whip up some custard yes um what do you think of um what do you think of tinned custard yeah, it's, some of it's great. I mean, some of that instant ready-made custard is brilliant. I mean, it's fantastic. I mean, let's, we're not get. It's not rocket science here. Is it? it's cream and it's vanilla and it's eggs and it's delicious. Yeah. So if someone's doing it and the tin stuff, if it's thick, it's got thickening agent in. If it tastes, it's got nice, a, probably got corn flour in it, which yeah. isn't the end of the world, is it? Yeah, I think. Listen, I think it's great. I don't. I don't, I haven't got a problem there. Wouldn't serve it in a restaurant, but I would quite happily serve it to me mum if she came round for Sunday lunch and we've made a crumble. I think it's cobbler. still I think it's still made in Devon. They still have a factory that makes tinned Devon custard, which well, is go, rather then. wonderful and it goes all over the country. Good good for Devon. Um do you serve your custard hot or cold or depends on the dish. Oh. Depends on it. So if it's a hot dish, I quite like a cold custard. But if it's a cold dish, I don't mind it being a warm custard. Do you know what I mean? So it, it yeah. kind of, it varies. It varies. It's it's an you know it's it's it, 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 who I, to me any custard I don't care. Just get it on. Yeah. However, there are options. There's also cream and there's ice cream. There would there, would there be occasions when you'd 
use those instead of custard? Yeah, I think cre- pouring cream is quite nice to be used over the top of if you've got a very sweet, sickly, like uh, over the top golden syrup style steamed pudding. That's lovely to just do pouring cream. Or that's somewhere where if it's nice and hot, that's where I'd like the coldness of ice cream. The counterbalance of temperature is delicious. So a really good vanilla ice cream with that would be amazing. Yeah, Mel- but... Melting into it and you get a yeah. kind of hot and cold thing going on in your exactly. mouth. Exactly. Beautiful. Time. Not only just textural difference, but the temperature, which is really nice. I'm getting very hungry now, but we have to wait because we, <laughs> <laughs> we have to wait. No! Uh, uh, semolina, sago and tapioca are very, very divisive. What do you think of those? I think if they're treated in the right way, they are delicious. And it's about getting the flavours into it that you want to use it with. And those are the, that's where school dinners have been given a bad name because they've just been, it's a cheap alternative with something that's been whisked together, boiled up, served on the side like it's it's you just go made bright pink yeah and then yeah. you just go oh my god pink this frog is... spawn was y- the exactly. particular horror wasn't it yeah exactly but if you actually infuse it with flavors that you like whether it's spiced you know things like cinnamon or mace go really nicely with it ground mixed spice those sort of things they, 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 they can really give this beautiful flavored delicious dish you just got to make sure that texturally you get it right they have a very soft set, don't they, some of them? And, and there's a jelly-like thing going on there, which troubles some people, perhaps. Yeah, but they're absolutely... And that's just the natural starches that are coming out of the grain, like yeah. as if you're just stirring rice or rice pudding. It's very similar to those like grainy starches that come out. So it's it would just be a case of understanding what you're doing with it and, and not be scared off of what school dinner used to be. I'm not sure whether you can still buy Sago and tapioca in, in normal shops or whether it's now turned into a specialist thing. Yeah, I'm not sure. But to be honest, I have. If we, whenever we get it or whatever we use it for, we, you, we, got it, we order it from a dry store supplier. So I'm not sure. I've never looked for it in the supermarket. Maybe next time I do me shopping, I'll have a little Let's look. Let's try and get a bit of comeback going on for yeah. this. Um, yeah, uh, bring Sago, bright, Sago and bright tapioca. Pink and, <laughs> no, not pink. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Just Sago. And rice pudding? Are you a skin on top man or? Uh, love rice pudding and not a big fan of the skip well again that depends right so i like a chilled rice pudding absolutely delicious cooked properly and there's two ways i like the way of doing it with pudding rice where you cook it for ages but i quite like one where you you can you swap it out and do risotto rice so if you use the borio rice that cooks quite quickly and cook it out in 20 minutes and you've got this lovely rich sweet flavored delicious on the hob yeah on the hob in milk. In milk, yeah. In milk and cream and all the flavours that you put into a custard. And it's... you don't parboil the rice. So you put the risotto rice straight in with the milk and cream, boil it, and so that right. Keep stirring it, keep stirring it, keep stirring it. And all those lovely flavours there and delicious. And then I think it, it, I, you can caramelise the top with a little bit of sugar and blowtorch it and those sort of things. But, but like set on cold and a skin go on the top... I, I mean, I'd eat it. I mean, I don't. I, I think it's delicious. I, I, I don't get people said to go. Oh no, I wouldn't eat them. I mean, why wouldn't you eat the skin? Yeah, it's it's milk solids, isn't it? Yeah, and you get a sort of rather attractive tan colour, the skin, didn't it? Exactly, it gives it a lovely kind of warm caramelised taste to it. It's delicious. But when my mother used to make it in the oven, rice pudding. Um, it did cook the rice. It was quite nice. It was nice, her rice pudding. But there, it was often a kind of pool of liquid and then the brown skin on top. So maybe she was happy with that kind of... Um, maybe they turn the oven fun down fair a little of bit textures. longer. A fun fair of textures, yeah. The waltzer of textures. <laughs> Le- leave it to cook a little bit more and, and that kind of skin will have wrapped and, and join down, go closer to the rice. It's nice. A baked rice pudding like that is... Yeah, it's got a very old-fashioned feel to it and yeah. very sort of reassuring. Um, I think you're right in saying that these things give you a kind of emotional benefit um, regardless of what they might actually be doing for your diet. They do to us of an age where if you, I think if you're over 40, you remember those sorts of dishes and they think that you think they're amazing. I don't know how many kids today will have the same sort of understanding of what those puddings are because I don't think anyone's cooking them anymore. I think we're you, all do, doing do, do you try them out on your son? No, well, uh, uh, no well, he's just still a little bit young. We, we, trifle, I think 
that's still around for a you know and that'll be around forever that stood the test of time however those more solid robust things or things that are a little bit different like that I, like the sago puddings there'll be no kids there that recognize them crumbles i get trifles will always be there but steamed suet puddings how many people actually make them at home how many how many children today will have that as childhood memories or are they learning about different puddings are they learning about baking again are they learning much more complicated desserts or things that people are cooking at home it'd be quite interesting to see well at school they're probably not getting them at school which was a main reason that a lot of people hate them is because they were badly cooked at school rather yeah. than well cooked at home um kids are probably eating tiramisu nowadays aren't well, they? well that's it yeah of course <laughs> and only sourdough <laughs> sourdough bread and butter pudding or croissant yeah <laughs> that sussex pond pudding is a bit of a number isn't it oh, it's great though isn't it come on hey, what a beautiful surprise i'm not you quite and... sure what to do with the lemon in the middle because it is so such a hit of acidity and bitterness isn't it do you actually eat the lemon i know you're meant to yeah chop it up yeah 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 and, and if you steam it for long enough it should be so soft and delicious that it goes everywhere it's and a marmalade be- thing going on exactly yeah exactly that i love a sussex Pom pudding, I think it's great. I think it is. We, in fact, we are looking at bringing that back in one of the restaurants. We're trying. We're trying to perfect a way of getting it done so it's amazing. Would that be in a small version of it? Because the the thing is a bit colossal when it comes out with the it's whole huge, lemon you've inside. Got a whole lemon you of can't it. give anyone a whole lemon, can you? For no, dessert? no, no, no. So we're but looking at could, citrus could... fruit alternatives to do with it. So things, oh, little kumquats. So, yeah, maybe. Something. Yeah, exactly. Kumquats or key limes or you know something like that. Of going, how do we how do we have a go at playing at that? We haven't got it right yet. So I, I can't say yes. We've done that. It's amazing as an individual portion. But they are. I think it's a great dessert. That, that is very I mean, original, isn't it? Very, yeah. very, and wonderfully British. Uh, it is wonderfully it British, but it's very bizarre that it's got a lemon in it because a lemon isn't British. So you go, yeah. well, hold on a minute. And where have we come up with this? No, let's take something citrus that makes you think of the warm and the sunshine and makes you think of holidays and maybe the Amalfi Coast and everything that's incredible. And I know what we'll do. Let's cover it in a load of suet. <laughs> <laughs> and cook it for ages and then go, oh, oh, yeah, let's get this wonderful warm outdoor ingredient and wrap it up in sponge. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I got hold of a bergamot uh, a couple of months ago and I absolutely loved it. It's so fragrant. It's great, isn't it? And uh, so unlike it, it, it well, of course, it's the main ingredient, the flavouring for Earl Grey tea, but it's got that wonderful floral quality yeah it's kind of they look like big limes yeah like they look like big limes but they've got they have got that wonderful floralness to it they have that citrus kick but a big you know there's and something very, very special acid. and different yeah yeah something yeah. very special and different i knew it. someone who made some marmalade from it and was laboriously taking the skin off getting rid of the pith and taking the skin off it seemed a bit of an ordeal and he got a couple of jars at the end but he was obviously very thrilled was it um, nice did it was the marmalade nice? i didn't get to eat it he was wasn't going to give a, give these two jars away. Took him that long to make <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe, took him two of two of them a weekend, I think, to to make it. <sighs> Christmas pudding is a, another great favourite of mine, which is must be the ultimate kind of uh, gungy pudding filled with everything that you can possibly pack into it. I, I mean, I love it. And do you make Christ- them for the restaurant? Yeah, we do. We'll make Christmas puddings. We do those. We and then we turn. Sometimes we turn them into souffle. Sometimes we will turn them into mousses. Sometimes we just serve them straight. On Christmas the pudding souffle. Yeah. So does that you make a Christmas pudding and then you cut it up into little bits? Do you? Yeah. Or- blend that into a paste and then you use that paste to fold the egg whites into that you then cook the souffle with. So you've got this beautiful risen, light and airy Christmas pudding. What a lovely idea! Extra. Yeah, it's delicious. It works really, really well. It's a wonderful thing to do. Now I absolutely adore Christmas pudding although this Christmas uh, uh, just gone we had 17 people around my house for Christmas and only half wanted Christmas pudding it is one of those do you know what I love it and some people and just really not fans of it and it's because it's so big dark strong powerful flavors that I think some it does alienate people it's like but they're the same people that don't like Christmas pudding the same people that don't like sprouts yeah, yeah. I'm not inviting them again <laughs> 
<laughs> <laughs> I think that um, American Americans would regard us as they'd look at, at Christmas pudding as something that landed from outer space, wouldn't they? Because it's an alien piece of food. And I know that the French, I lived in France for six years and they had no idea at all what, we, what on earth we were talking about with this Christmas pudding. And it's such an odd looking thing as well as everything else, pitch black and steaming and a light, of yeah. course. <laughs> yeah, but beautiful flavour. I mean, it's just such a fantastic... If it's had time to mature, it's a, it's a, amazing. a wonderful thing. And do you know a really good thing with Christmas pudding? It's great. This is a this is a bit of a secret thing, but it's great the next day with a full English breakfast. Christmas oh, pudding and a full instead English pudding. Instead of black pudding or as no, well as black pudding? No, yeah, as well as black, black pudding. pudding. Right. So think of, that's exactly what it is. If you think of Christmas pudding, right, this is why it's so lovely, as a cross between black pudding and brown sauce, <laughs> where it's fruity, sweet and goodness and all of those sort of things. This is a stretch for my imagination, It's delicious. Tom. You trust me on this. You try it. It's <laughs> amazing with a full English. Christmas pudding and bacon. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Still to come on BBC Good Foods podcast with Tom Kerridge. And this is the ultimate plum and apple cobbler. Yeah. Which you'll find, <laughs> find on the website. It smells amazing. They look fantastic. I mean, it's like the ultimate, like, crumble, but crumble dumplings. That's it. We, we won't call it, let's scrap the name cobbler. Let's call it crumble dumplings. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever eaten any ready-made puds that were any good? Because they do sell them in tins. Is that too retro, do you think? No, they do. And actually, I don't mind them. There's a couple of them that are all right. And um, one of the, actually, we touched on it earlier, the Cartmel guys that are making the sticky toffee I pudding. Think I think they make it in a little tray, don't they? Do, they? Yeah, yeah, and I've it's very that. good. It is a very, very good product. And there, there are some great... Everyone's getting a, little, a lot better, particularly those the manufacturers that are having to make puddings, because everyone's getting much better at baking at home. We've got back to being good at cooking. You know, people are having a go at doing desserts and people are enjoying it. And people are more likely to have a go at making a dessert than they are at actually having to go cooking something a main course because they go, well, the main course, we can just have pasta, but I've spent this time making a pudding because you can get the kids involved. You can go fruit picking. You can do, it's quite interactive. So the idea of me, so those packet guys or the people that have pre-made desserts have had to get better because everyone's getting better at home. We're demanding more, we're asking more and people don't want to spend 15 quid on a dessert for the family and then go, actually, I could have made that better myself and the kids would have enjoyed doing it and it could have given us something to do on a Sunday morning. You know, that's quite good for Fun. So, yeah, I think those guys are having to get a lot better. They've had to raise their game they have. according to the nation's cooking skills improved. Yes. Do you think the nation's cooking cooking skills have improved, though? Hugely. That's really good news because I'm never quite sure that people aren't just watching marvellous things happen on television, but then not doing it at home. No, but, well, even, listen, there, what, there's, we, there's more TV, there's more magazines, there's more media all about, there's more podcasts, there's more the talking about food there's lots going on that and doesn't reason, mean that that doesn't mean that people are cooking it of course of course does it does it? it means that there's a higher <laughs> interest in it there's more want in it there's more like okay so if you've got more if you've got a million people watching television and magazines and whatever that weren't doing it in the first place even if 10 of them are doing it that's more people we are getting better we are our love of food is huge it's driven by consumer and that's only a good thing because the consumer wants better we as providers of both media and television and also restaurants have to be better because the consumer knows more and wants more which in turn we put pressure on producers suppliers supermarkets all it's doing is a big circle of constantly improving standards because it's driven by people's want to be better and eat more food that is a better quality of history and heritage understanding where it comes from and wanting to cook it themselves so that it starts with the consumer want that we're providing that we have to be better with that lends to food being better across board which means people are cooking more. They understand it more. Well, that's very good news. It's great I'm, news. I'm glad. And I, I, you've talked me into that. Great. I've got two personal cookery problems, which I'm hoping that you can help me with. OK. Um, my crumble is sometimes a bit soggy. And I thought, thought I've done everything right. I do it in quite a thin layer, not, not super thick like school days where it's like two inches thick with no fruit at the bottom. Um, and it, it, it's a bit kind of wet. 
that might and it might be because you're doing it too thin too thin so, yeah too thin too because thin. Cause you've then got too much moisture steam coming up from your from your from from below you need you by the time it's cooked it's kind of absorbed so all I the need juices. top layer yeah to, you, to keep you need that it in to be to... thick enough to make it and also when you crumble it together you've got to make sure that you've got it's uneven you don't want it to be even you're not rubbing it in like sand you no. want it to be quite clumpy do yeah you? you want clumpy okay. and then squeeze it together with your hands little bit so you get smaller different sizes little nuggety bits so that when you actually cook it it is uneven like the surface of the moon that bits will be shardy and broken and those are the bits that will crisp up I know that's what people do when they're frying chicken if they really want to fry chicken at home they make a, a dusty thing to to coat the chicken in do you know and a they good clump thing that goes it they into clump that? it up yeah do you know a good thing that goes into what's that what's that Broken up cornflakes. If you put oh, some broken up cornflakes yeah. into that dusting for fried chicken, yeah. same thing. And you get the kind of clumps, the clunches, perhaps. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. However, that we digress from old-fashioned thicker, puddings, don't thick, we? Thicker layer of crumble on your crumble. The other thing is that my all-time favourite uh, old-fashioned pudding is this lemon pudding. Do you remember the one where you it sets to a kind of sauce at the bottom and a sponge at the top? And you, 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 you make a... A, you mix together a, a kind of sponge mix yeah. with butter and sugar and then you fold the flour into it and then you, you beat the egg yolk into it and then you whisk the egg white and you fold that through with some milk and it sets into a layer of spongy lemon pudding at the top with a sauce at the bottom. And anyway, it doesn't matter whether you know it or not, but they tell me to cook this in a bain marie. Yeah. Is that really necessary for baked puddings or do you think we can get away without it? I think in modern day ovens, you can definitely get away with it. Right? Because what happens is in th those were ovens when everyone used to have a gas oven at home. Like, I mean, again, it's coming back to us being a little bit older, that those gas ovens would have the flame that would come on at the bottom and they weren't circulated very well. And they weren't. So to, to ensure that you have even heat. It was a case of setting it into the, the bamery into the water that would help okay. would help hold it. These modern day ovens where you just then most of them are electric, sunk into your beautifully fitted kitchen that you yeah. turn you you put it on a fan assisted 150 degrees. All of a sudden you've got very even cookery. So I think you'd definitely be able to get away with it. Yeah, I mean, lower temperature, more even cookery. My oven definitely cooks hotter at the back from the front. I have to turn everything round. Maybe I need a better oven. Well, yeah, or you've just got to know it yeah you know, i do it's, it's not such a hassle to nah. turn the thing around and you can take a look at it and enjoy looking at it halfway through anyway it, exactly the only problem with that would be souffles or yorkshire puddings That's which, where you, which you, you don't, don't want, want to be messing yeah. with them you've probably got amazing ovens in your kitchens though haven't you um, they like at rocket, work, rocket propelled. They are, yeah, at work. We, we have, yeah, actually at the Hand of Flowers and at Carriage, we have ovens on each section. Each section has their own individual oven, which is quite, yeah, so it's they, they, it's all about precision and getting it right. And then at home, I've got um, two two electric, I'm very quite, I'm quite fortunate I've got two, uh, two ovens that are kind of like set into a liner cupboards so pretty much like most people's houses at home in the restaurant kitchens do you have those things that cool things down very quickly blast chillers blast chillers yes we do they must be amazing they are amazing they take up a lot of room and they're really blooming expensive oh. but they're, but they're kind of they're environmental health reasons they're the sort of thing because you want food to be chilled as quickly as possible so you've got no chance of any form of nastiness being allowing to grow any bacteria or anything so it's a case of when things are cooked they go into blast chillers and they're chilled as quickly as possible I, I'd love one in my kitchen because I seem to be waiting for things to cool down rather too often. Honestly, but one then, of the, if you think of the size of a big stand-up fridge, times that by at least three, that's what that's how big you're going to need it. As oh, a that's the size of my kitchen, though. <laughs> well, there you go. You don't want a blast chiller. You just want a window that's open. <laughs> <laughs> the happy moment has arrived, Tom, when we're going to eat something delicious. And this is the ultimate plum and apple cobbler, yeah. which you'll find, <laughs> find on the website. It and, smells amazing. Yeah. And it's got that lovely brown bit round the edge. And I'm going to crinkle some foil. We yep. love our sound effects. Then we crinkle, crinkle, crinkle of foil. Look at that. See, look, so they're like baked dumplings. They've got a lovely, crispy, crusty top. They look fantastic. It, I mean, it's like the ultimate, like, crumble, but crumble dumplings. That's it. We, we won't call it, scrap the name cobbler. Let's call it crumble dumplings. Crumble dumplings in a, in a, in a purple purple sea of deliciousness and a purple sea of deliciousness a plum and apple and now we have jack who's passing us little bowls 
We get good service there here, we don't go. we? Here's a spoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. The recipe looks quite easy. The, the thing that would fox me, because I've never made a cobbler, is making sure that I don't make the mixture, too, the cobbler mixture too wet. You said it's like a thick batter. I suppose I could follow the recipe for once in my life, couldn't I? <laughs> but you don't want that batter too thick, but you want it. You want it wet enough that it will spread a bit. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So when you, so when it gets baked, it kind of spreads across the top of the of the, of the fruit puree or kind of the fruit mash stuff that you got at the bottom. It's, you just make the fruit thing the same as you would any other crumble, and then on top of that, you 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 put the the mixture. But it, yeah, a little bit soggy, like a soggy wet dough almost that you just dump on. And then as it bakes, it spreads out. That's a bit different from other things. So I'm going to I'm going to pay attention. Yeah. In fact, my soggy crumble was probably going in this direction. Yeah. <laughs> but I, it never quite got there. Well, that's it. You should have just called it a cobbler. <laughs> we also have, having spoken about custard and cream and ice cream, look what we've got here. We've got stick to your ribs, clotted cream. How about that? You a clotted cream fan? I love clotted cream. I mean, again, it's another one of those West Country greats that, I mean, it's beautiful. It's just rich. It's intense. It's fantastic. It's got fantastic texture. And it's got so much flavour, hasn't it? It's, uh, is that because it's just been simmered down and simmered? How long does it take to make clotted cream? Well, they bake it. So they be- they put the cream into trays and they put it in the oven and they just gently heat it until a lot of the moisture evaporates and it kind of reduces down in the oven and it's delicious. And we've got some cinnamon in there as well. We've got cinnamon to just give it a little bit of spice. But if cinnamon isn't your thing, cardamom could be quite interesting. Mace is great. Ground mixed spice is lovely. All of those sort of spicy flavours. I mean, it's delicious. I mean, from, I'm I'm looking at this. I'm looking. I think that whole bowl might go. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a bowl looking at me now here of ultimate. Fabulousness with a great lump of clotted cream on my spoon. So once I start that, you're not going to hear anything else from me. So I'd like to say thank you enormously, Tom. That was fascinating. And I'm going to go off and buy myself some suet and get boiling some puddings. A pleasure. Well, how delicious was that? Thank you for listening to today's show. You'll find the recipe and thousands more on bbcgoodfood.com. If you have a minute, we'd love to hear from you on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram at BBC Good Food.